So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to tell you about work we have been doing uh, that has now been extended into the area of transportation light weighting using hybrid coatings. Now, hybrid materials and the, the kind of hybrid material I'm talking about here are those that are formed with inorganic and organic components essentially tailored at molecular length scales. So we connect them um, and we can make a variety of multifunctional coatings that can have different properties ranging from high stiffness, high hardness, wear properties through high transparencies and even conducting uh, uh, properties uh, as you'll see in the talk today. Uh, and they're used in a wide range of different technologies that could be used uh, in anything from anti-reflection coding systems through to sensors, uh, barrier films for photovoltaics. Um, they're used in um, emerging stretchable and wearable electronic areas, touch display, um, and of course, as I'll, I'll talk to you about today, uh, in the area of coding plastic substrates uh, for transportation light weighting. Uh, another advantage of these materials is that they can be made potentially very cheaply. And particularly what I want to focus on today is the use of atmospheric plasma deposition. So we create a plasma in California air uh, at room temperature, or at least low temperature, and we can then deposit onto uh, 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 surfaces like plastics. So um, polymeric glazing and moldings are an extremely high want uh, from the transportation community. Uh, there's a number of very real benefits here. And of course, you guys all know, we already drive automobiles that have a large number of plastic components. Don't always survive very, uh, very long. Um, so the advantages here are lightweight. Um, in the US alone, on an annual basis, if we were to replace just the uh, glass glazing in cars, you would save something like 195 million pounds. Um, worldwide, that translates into something like 1.24 billion pounds. So that's a lot of mass that you wouldn't otherwise have to move around. But it actually turns out that that's really only one of the benefits. Uh, another, another benefit here is that you lower the center of mass of the vehicle. So from a crash worthiness point of view, this actually uh, presents a, a big advantage. Um, there's a significant amount of part consolidation that you get by using plastic substrates and moldings. Uh, you can in enable aerodynamic improvements in vehicles, and of course we're seeing that in many um, uh, lower cost vehicles now that are being produced. And, and maybe one of the most important reasons from a marketing point of view is actually improved aesthetics of vehicles. You can make really cool looking transportation vehicles when you have the ability to mold in a relatively inexpensive way with, with plastic moldings. So, so what's the problem? The, the problem is you can't put a plastic substrate out into the terrestrial environment and expect it to last very long. It, it simply doesn't. It needs protection, and we're all familiar with this. It, it, this is a pervasive problem in, in any form of plastic coating that actually is used in terrestrial applications. In, in current coatings just don't meet performance standards. So this is a real problem. Um, coding methods that are used to actually make coatings, of course, typically either use vacuum-based systems where you can form some of the highest quality coatings, but then, of course, all the parts have to be put into a vacuum chamber. You have to pump it down to do the deposition. So that actually is, um, puts lots of constraints on things like throughput and makes the coding process expensive. Uh, on the other hand, there are various ways of using sol gel chemistries um, to make coatings. The problems here are uh, often related to solvents that basically come out of the, 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 the processing um, methods, uh, and that presents uh, other problems and environmental challenges. And in all of these cases, as I've mentioned, we really do need to improve properties significantly. So that's the focus of what we've been trying to do on this program that's been newly supported by GSEP and involves um, thinking about ways of making much better protective systems, uh, coating systems for, for plastic substrates. 
And let me acknowledge my, my students, as you see over here, and postdoc, who, um, who have actually done all of the work that I'll show you today. So a couple of little sections that I wanted to go through in this talk. The, the first is, since we really care about making durable systems, I wanted to say just a little bit about what it is you need to know about a coding system um, that really is a key metric for its reliability. Uh, then I'll turn to a, a section dealing with codings that we're actually making and show you what I think are some very real successes uh, in building some really um, impressive coding systems that have much better properties than even the, the best current commercial systems and then show you how these methods can be extended uh, to make things like uh, other functional codings involving, for example, anti-reflection coding systems um, and transparent and conducting films. So with respect to uh, lifetimes, um, from a thermomechanical point of view, one of the most important aspects for long-term reliability and durability of a coding system is, of course, how well it adheres to the substrate. And over many years now, and I'll show you some a compendium of data here, uh, we have developed methods to measure uh, adhesion in thin film systems um, where we can do this very accurately and very reproducibly um, to obtain either the adhesion of the interface or the cohesion of the layer. So, so this is going to feature in this talk because it's, it's one of the most fundamental metrics of long-term durability. Now, though, uh, let me also mention, though, that um, even if um, you've not exceeded the driving forces for, let me see if I can get this cursor to work here. For, no, I'm not able. To, oh, there it is there. So, so this is the driving force here, G, that comes from the sort of stresses that might be present in a coding or the handling or packaging or whatever it is. When that exceeds the cohesion energy, then of course the system will fail. Uh, but it turns out that, that if G is, is less than, than the adhesion energy, then in the presence of environmental species or incoming photons from the, um, uh, the environment or the, the sun, um, or uh, you know, with increasing temperature, then coatings might cohesively crack uh, and debond from the substrate. And I'm, I'm showing a picture here uh, of an actual commercial coating that was used on an aerospace commercial window application. So when you next fly on a plane, if you look out of the window, sometimes you'll see that sort of slightly crazed um, uh, appearance. And what this is, in fact, is exactly what you're seeing here. It's the most typical degradation process that happens uh, to protective coding systems. So uh, one measure of making a better coding is actually to be able to characterize these adhesive properties and also to characterize the kinetics of how fast they come apart. And so this is something we do in all of the work we do, whether it's related to solar technologies or microelectronic device technologies going through to uh, coding systems, as I'm talking about here. And I wanted to show this data here which represents the adhesion. Uh, these were the first measures uh, of adhesion of commercial coding systems that are used on commercial aircraft. Um, they had been used for literally years, in some case decades. Some of them were known to perform better. Um, some of them were known not to perform as well. But there was no metric by which this had been measured and characterized. So we were really able to do this for the, for the first time. Uh, and this is some of the original data that I'm, I'm showing here. There's some other interesting kinetic phenomenon that happens when you actually irradiate the specimen in situ with UV light, as you can see here. The little sample is sitting down over there. And here we can measure the rate at which these interfaces are debonding. And the important point here is that you can see this is just the mechanical loads on the bottom. This is the rate at the, uh, on, the, on the vertical axis. But you can see that it's not just mechanical loads that are important. It's incoming photons that are destabilizing, basically being absorbed um, and, and cleaving bonds uh, that give rise to an acceleration in the debond process. So, so these are the things we've characterized, and, and, and I promised you a compendium of data. This is a slide that I like to show that, that shows the range of adhesion values for a, for a wide range of different materials and coatings, everything from microelectronics to organic photovoltaics to 
you know, the recent perovskite systems, you can see wide ranges in, in, in properties here. Clearly, higher numbers here indicate better performance. And so the coding systems we're looking at here started around about 10 and increase. So, so that's a little calibration. Let me tell you now about some of the, the coatings that we're making for plastic substrates. So, so we create plasmas with, with two different methods. Uh, one is with a um, capacitively coupled plasma system shown in the middle. This typically uses either helium uh, or nitrogen gas. Um, it's a low temperature plasma. Uh, or uh, on the, on the um, right-hand side is a dielectric barrier a breakdown system that, that where we can create um, slightly higher temperature plasmas. Uh, the advantages here is that we can do it with just normal compressed air, uh, obviously using helium uh, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the capacitively coupled system is not really conducive to um, industrial scale manufacturing. Now these, these plasmas, by the way, are ubiquitous. Practically every large company that applies protective coatings has them. It's the, they're mostly used for preparing the surface, functionalizing the surface, cleaning it, rather than doing the deposition. So some of the, the innovation we've been able to, to make here is to actually use ways of delivering the, the precursors of coatings that we want to build uh, into these plasmas uh, and then depositing them on, uh, on the substrate. Now, uh, this is a, a plasma-assisted process. We use precursors of various types. Uh, we've typically only used very simple, inexpensive precursors so that we can make this a scalable manufacturing, low-cost process. Um, uh, and there are complex reactions that happen as these precursors decompose, uh, and then basically uh, a film is grown, a coating is grown on the substrate. And we monitor these processes with, with various methods, including optical spectroscopies um, and in situ mass spectroscopy to figure out um, what the mechanisms are and what the decomposition processes of the precursors are. So let me show you some of the high, sort of higher level results here. Um, the first is uh, to show you the kind of highly transparent coatings that we can make. Now, uh, these coatings, and you can see one over here towards the bottom, are essentially 100% uh, transparent in the visible. You simply cannot measure that those coatings are present. Um, this is a coating on a polycarbonate substrate uh, here. Uh, and then above that are uh, two of the core properties that we would measure. One is the stiffness uh, of the coating in the form of the elastic modulus. Um, and the other is the, the adhesion energy, which I've, I've already mentioned. Now, I, I've circled two of the coatings that we've, we've made here. Um, um, they're made with the same precursor. We just simply adjust the, the plasma conditions. And, and in one case, you can see we can make a very stiff coating. Uh, this coating has a stiffness um, that's very high. Uh, the, 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 um, the star that you see here uh, is, is the best current commercial sol gel coating. So this is what's typically used for aerospace window applications. And you can see that the, the, the coatings that we can make are actually much stiffer. Now, stiffer coatings mean better wear properties, wear and abrasion properties. And that's, again, one of the most important things that you, you, you look for in a protective coating. So we can make stiffer coatings. You can't do this with sol gel processes because you can't use high enough annealing temperatures to actually develop the highly connected molecular network that would give you these stiffnesses. Um, on the other hand, uh, we can also buy, and these are the same two coding systems here shown on the other side, we can make them very adhesive. So the stiffer coding here, the, essentially a dense silica coding made with atmospheric plasma, essentially has the same adhesion value as a good commercial coding. Um, but the, uh, the other coding that's slightly less stiff we, we actually incorporate little carbon bridges into these coatings, uh, and we can make them adhere uh, very well to the substrate. So we can get a combination here in these two different coatings of either high stiffness, which means high wear abrasion properties, or high adhesion, which also translates into longer-term durability. So the key then was to see whether we could do these things together, and we did this with a bilayer. We, we used the adhesive coating on the bottom, the stiff coating on the top, 
that's shown over here. Uh, and you can see that th we can achieve this bilayer coding over here, which in terms of both ad uh, stiffness and adhesion has far superior properties to the very best commercial coding that's currently available. So this is, this is caused a lot of interest. We have a number of companies that are now thinking about using these types of systems. We're actually engaged with several of them uh, doing real um, industry-like abrasion uh, and durability tests to assess the efficacy of these coatings. Th those coatings were made with just one precursor. We can make these coatings with several different types of pre uh, precursors. We can grow them very quickly. And you can see here again is another set of data showing uh, another bilayer coating. This one is actually made much more quickly with even cheaper precursors uh, and again has this great combination of properties. But wait, there's more. We also in my group do spray deposition for various uh, uh, different material systems. And just very recently in the, as part of our GSEP program, we've started looking at combining spray coating, uh, which of course is something that the industry is very familiar with, with atmospheric plasma deposition. Uh, and here uh, we can think about making an underlying um, thick coating with the spray deposition as, sh as shown over here, uh, and then basically come over the top of that with a uh, atmospheric plasma deposited film. Now, I mentioned that this is a capability in my group. We have a significant sol gel capability. We make lots of different coatings. This is one hybrid coating that's made with an epoxy functionalized silane and a zirconium alkoxide precursor. Uh, there's advantages of using this, this zirconium uh, alkoxide. We can form very moisture resistant coatings. Um, and so in this work, what we've done uh, is to actually uh, do what I just said, which is to make now a bilayer coating with initially spray uh, and then atmospheric plasma. And, and here we have achieved the highest adhesion values we have ever seen for a coating system. Um, you can see here uh, adhesion values for this bilayer spray atmospheric plasma coating that are in excess of 60 joules per meter squared. And in fact, the failure here cannot happen at the interface. It happens in the bulk substrate. So we've made the interface and the coating so resistant to failure that it now fails in the substrate. Uh, and that, of course, is the measure of the best possible um, uh, protective coating. So we're very excited about this strategy. Uh, this allows us to do it really quickly, not a long process. We can actually combine the spray head with the plastic, uh, with the plasma head and move the, the two on a gantry together. Uh, could be moved over curved surfaces. So there's a lot of potential here for this, uh, for this method. Um, it, it, let me just spend the last couple of minutes talking about two other areas where we can use atmospheric plasma. Uh, one is in the um, um, uh, uh, production of anti-reflection coating systems. Again, there are advantages here because we can do this quickly, we can do it at low temperature, we can do it on plastics, we can do it on other um, devices, device materials, uh, and clearly there's many applications um, where sensors are used or where uh, uh, glazings are used where anti-reflection properties are important. Uh, our early work has looked just at single layer coatings, and you can see here are the simulations showing the effect of a single layer coating on reducing the reflection uh, from a, um, a, a device surface. In this case, this is a silicon device. Obviously, if you use multi-layer coatings, you can get better anti-reflection properties. And, and again, we've done this in air. So, so no vacuum equipment here, no solution chemistry. This is just in air. Um, and you can see here with either tantalum or uh, titanium coatings, the, um, the very significant improvement we get uh, in anti-reflection properties, uh, just with a single layer. So our, our work here now is looking at extending this to multi-layers, uh, where we expect that we can uh, achieve even better uh, anti-reflection coatings uh, properties. And, and then finally, I'll make mention of um, some uh, work we've done in transparent conducting films. Of course, you, you, you'll, many of you will know there's a lot of interest in replacing some of the more expensive um, transparent conducting uh, materials like indium tin oxide. And zinc oxide, of course, is potentially a very inexpensive alternative. The, the problem is that most zinc oxides have been made with um, uh, vacuum-based systems and, and techniques. 
uh, a very good quality films, high transparencies, uh, good conductivities, but you need expensive processing. So, so we've attempted to do this, again, just with atmospheric plasma in normal air environments, and, and this has been successful. Um, despite the fact that many people that are involved with much more sophisticated CBD processes told us that it would never work, but in fact, um, uh, unencumbered by that kind of knowledge, we, we went out and did it anyway. And um, you can see here very successful coding um, here of uh, several different polymers. We've, we've coded PMMAs, polycarbonates, PET. Uh, we, we have a good adhesive film. We can get transparencies of up to 98%. And when you look at the all-important um, resistivity, you can see here uh, values as low as uh, 100 ohm centimeters uh, were achieved, again, in air, no annealing, no doping, simply deposited uh, at low temperatures on, on plastics. So again, we've, we're excited about this. We haven't even really started to look in detail at what we could achieve with doping, and we can, we can easily dope in these processes, um, um, hopefully to get uh, even better um, conductivities in these materials. And you can do the same thing with, with Thai nitride, Thai oxide hybrid blends. And again, here we can achieve um, um, uh, resistivities on, on the order of 100 ohm centimeters. So uh, we, we think there's a lot of um, possibilities for atmospheric plasma deposition. It's, a, every, it's like a toaster. Most companies have them. Uh, nobody's just really thought of, of, of taking this additional step injecting precursors into these systems and being able to fabricate everything from really protective, high-quality uh, coating systems uh, through to uh, uh, other uh, uh, functional coatings that could be used for, for sensor uh, uh, and other um, uh, technologies that include everything from display through solar. So thank you for your attention. for questions. The uh, application to GSEP would tend to be, I would think, in, in making lightweight moldings and then put these coatings on them so that they're strong enough and, and, and that, last long enough. That's true. So the, the breakthrough that affects decarbonization is in lightweight vehicles. Is that right? That's correct. Well, in, in transportation systems in general, I mean, it's you know, the focus, the, the sexy pictures that I show are of these cool cars, but, you know, there's, there's application in uh, um, uh, lightweight um, trucks. Uh, Ford is actually about to announce a, a truck that will have all polymer glazing. Um, so there's, there's applications in areas like that or in other transportation systems. Uh, uh, anywhere where you're moving large masses and, you know, there would be an advantage of using um, a plastic substrates as opposed to the much more heavier uh, substrates that would typically be used. Hi. <coughs> Hi. Your high adhesive coatings, what happens to them when you're recycling? And what happens to those chemicals when they are uh, maybe evaporated by heat uh, and go into the environment? Yeah, good question. And um, the, the, the basic components of our coatings, particularly those hybrid coatings, are they're essentially organosilicate materials. Um, so we, we don't really have anything other than carbon, silicon, and oxygen in those coatings. And so there's no um, particularly environmentally dangerous uh, atoms present uh, in those particular coatings. So, um, uh, you know, they're, they're designed not to decompose. Obviously, as a protective coating, you, you'd like it not to undergo any easy decomposition process. Um, but basically, you know, if you were to heat them up uh, to higher temperatures in, in the presence of oxidizing environment, they would basically decompose into silicon, oxygen, and carbon. So is it correct that the biggest failure mode you're worrying about for the automotive glazings is, is UV light accelerating uh, the crazing 
Um, and if, if that's right, uh, what materials, what coatings could you put on there that would uh, block the UV light to protect the plastic? Yeah, Mike, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it, it turns out, well, UV light is not the only thing we're concerned about. You, 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 know, you, you primarily have to initially start worrying about things like wear and abrasion resistance. So you want high stiffness coatings. You need them to be adhesive because otherwise they don't stay on. But you're right, and as I showed, UV light actually accelerates the, the debonding processes, the cohesive cracking, and there's even some other bulk properties, changes in the films that can happen. So in addition to the coatings as I've described them, you also need a UV protection package. And I didn't show any of the results that, that, that we have, um, but Singming, who's actually sitting um, uh, right over there, has been looking at incorporating UV absorbing um, um, molecules uh, uh, during the atmospheric plasma deposition. And he's actually succeeded. Uh, so we can actually deposit the underlying layer um, with a UV absorbing molecule that will actually shield the underlying polymer from UV light. Because in, in fact, it's the, the, you're, you're less concerned about the coatings in terms of UV degradation. It's more the, the underlying um, substrate that needs to be protected. So in, including UV absorbing molecules is something that we're, we're doing. Um, including nanoparticles is the other strategy. And we haven't started that work yet, but as part of what uh, we want to do in, in the GCEP effort is actually to include nanoparticles um, during deposition. Uh, these are the typical UV-absorbing nanoparticles that, that, that would provide that kind of protection. But, but it's important to in include that as well. Okay, thank you very much for a great presentation. Sure.